granted the vote, they took it. Mm. I heard that statement the other day and I thought, boy, that's a good start for us all. Um, we've heard a lot this year, the last year completely about women's suffrage. And I think most people know that Wyoming gave women the right to vote in 1869 and seven other states granted it even before Indiana did. So we were a little slow on it, but it happened. In 1851, there was an Indiana Women's Suffrage Association that talked to the state legislature calling for the right to vote temperance and equal rights and child labor. We started marching about 1913 in Indiana itself, 1881, an amendment was made for women to vote and presented to the state general assembly. But when it met again in 1883, it was found somehow it had never been recorded in the official records and therefore did not exist. A partial suffrage act was passed in 1917 for women to vote in local and presidential elections. And in Indiana, nearly 40,000 women registered to vote. You just had to be over the age of 21 years and an American citizen. They could go to the local county clerk's office or sign a form in front of a notary public. Imagine how many women lined up to do that. But this was struck down just before the November elections. Men figured it was too costly for separate ballot boxes and counting costs. Later, women were also judged to be too sentimental to sit on juries. Well, maybe we could vote, but we couldn't sit on a jury. In 1927, an article in the New York Times claimed the courts would have fainting fits and outbursts of tears and some cases were not for delicate ears to hear. Meanwhile, back in Harrison County, Corrida, first state capital, 1816 to 1825. Okay. The 19th Amendment said, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. This was ratified the 16th of January, 1920. Indiana was the 26th state to ratify. I'm just screeching. Don't you wonder how men viewed this? We sometimes wonder. At the time of the 1920 census, Harrison County had 13 townships. Okay, this is where I get into the project that I worked on. And in the basement of our library, I see anything that looks like old papers, I've got to go snoop. And so I found some, some file envelopes tied up with pink ribbons. It's still giving me that strength, rattling, echoing, and yes, screeching. That's for bringing in our tech expert. Shall I keep on talking? Yeah, it, I think let's take just a couple minute break. Just a couple minute break while we get this feedback problem fixed. Sounding so loud. Hey, Carolyn. Hi. Okay. I thought I had Carolyn muted, so that might be part of the problem. Okay. Should I try going on? Uh, we got a person coming in. Wow. It is a lot of feedback. Uh, Nice. 
that's not it, the Jeff Lockberry. Mm. You think that's coming out of the Jeff Lockberry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. This looks like a tech person coming in. Okay, how is that? Are we, can you hear me better now? Yes. Oh, yeah, much, much better. Great. Good to see you. Yeah, see the tech man walked in the door and it stopped acting up. It's magic. It's, it's magic. I, I, I shut everyone else's sound down. Oh, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, meanwhile, back in Harrison County. Digging around the basement of our library, I found some manila folders tied with pink ribbons. And on each one, it said it was from a different township. Inside the loose pieces of paper like this, now quite yellowed and getting brittle, but this is where all the women came and registered to vote. They put down where they were living, their name. I am a female voter. I live, this just happened to be uh, Webster Township. I was 37 years of age on the 30th of December, 1921. So we now have their dates of birth. This was pretty exciting. Another DAR sister and I went through them, put them in some semblance of an order. And occasionally we would find this one isn't pink but it's bigger and it was bright pink. And this was a foreign born naturalized voter. So we had foreign born women living in Harrison County. Not a whole lot, but a number of them. So this was pretty neat. At the age, the youngest person we found to register to vote was 20. The oldest one was 90 years of age. Many were in their 80s. And I think everyone here knows if you've done genealogy, our birth records didn't start till 1882. But if we have women now born in the 1840s and 1850s, we've got birth dates. Aha. Going through them, we just looked over them and thought, wow, where to start? Many of these women had men helping them fill out the forms and they signed on the bottom with an X. I'd say about one out of 25 could not sign their own names, but they wanted to vote. Uh, and sometimes the names differed from what the enumerator put on the top and the way she signed her name most interesting. Uh, for one example, I had a Lizzie Eisenmenger. On the ancestry censuses, she was listed as Louisa, Louise, and even Lula, but never Liz Lizzie. But she called herself Lizzie. So that would throw things off a little bit. Some were written in pencil. And after a hundred and some years, it was getting hard to read. We had lots of diminutive type names. Hetty, Nanny, Kate, Randa, Lizzie, Minnie, Molly, even Ollie. And what I found was neat, first names we don't hear much anymore or I've never heard of. But I do have to say, I still find Moon Unit and Dweezel of this generation as still some of the most unusual names. We had names, first names of Saloma, Alda, Zeta, Marshy, Sani, Dorothea, Rilda, Bina, Zeta, Bertilla. It sounds like I'm doing lyrics to a song. Abra, Ziola, Zella, Lavesi, Farrell, Roxa, Lucine, Zelmia, Marzala, Moini, Gilla, uh, Lodema, Merle, Clella, Oda, Loki, Velva, and many more. Three names I found were very unique. Zelma Epervia, Addie Valina, and Preshi Dell. And we thought names today were strange. I mean, wow. Some of the most common names, and we don't hear these much anymore. Minnie, Cora, 
Ida, and of course, a lot of Mary's, Margaret's, and Elizabeth's. Um, some ladies also signed up using their maiden names. But the best thing about this project was their dates of birth and where they were born give us so much information. Uh, and, and just the treat of some of them saying most were born in Harrison County, but some were born in France, some in Germany, many in Louisville, Kentucky counties, Arkansas, Vermont. How did these people get to Harrison County? I followed just a few of these ladies at random because they seemed like interesting ladies. In Evans Landing, October 1922, we find Lavina Critchlow, who was 90 years old, born in Butler County, Pennsylvania, and she could sign her name. So she was born in 1832. She died in Illinois, and they brought her back and buried her in Evans Landing in 1926. You know a lot about this lady now, don't we? In L Lanesville, I found three nuns who registered to vote. Sister Lucia Andres, Sister Engelberta Hammerly, and Sister Cassili Fleeg. A few wrote themselves down as Mrs. Elizabeth Jones, and a few even as Mrs. John Jones. We all know and have seen obituaries stating Mrs. John Jones died and you never hear her first name. We've all seen those. In New Salisbury, I found Thelma Adamson, 86 years old, signed with an X. She was born 1836, but we now have her date of birth and she died in 1922. Jane Patterson, 80 years of age, born Greene County, Tennessee. Leonora Torrey, who was 78 years old in 1922, born in Vermont, which means 1844. Lydia Colvin, age 85 years, born 1838, died 1923 in Floyd County, very shortly after she had registered to vote in Harrison County. Bertha Byerly was 27 years old in 1922, signed with an X and died in Mead County, 1939. I also found in Scott Township, which doesn't exist anymore, 1922 was an Irene Weaver. She was a notary public, a woman holding a public office. <laughs> and later I found in the 1910 census, they had women enumerators going around. And that surprised me. Who knew it for the census? What I thought was neat for many of these ladies, they were still alive in 1942, 20 years later. And we were again at war. They would have seen World War I and World War II. Uh, Mary Dots, who was born the 7th of December, 1876. She died in 1961, but she would have seen Pearl Harbor Day on her birthday, the 7th of December, 1941. <clears throat> Elsie Cost was 32 years of age in 1922, which means she was born 1890. She died in New Albany in 1969, and she would have seen D-Day on her birthday, the 6th of June, 1944. Just think of the history of these women heard and saw and experienced. But of course, not everybody lived long lives. Pearl Engelman, a good old Harrison and Floyd County name, born 1901, registered to vote in 1922. She died in 1937, Grand Rapids, Michigan, single at home and died from heart disease. Few quirky ones, Zeta Hannell, born 1873, signed with an X. Find a grave, this sir is Rosa Zadie Hannell. 
Mia Mae Franks Abelson, born in Orange County. I looked on her for the census. She showed up in no census records, no death records, no find a grave. But she showed up on a registration to vote. What happened to her? Who knows? Uh, Myrtle Cop gave her birth date as the 23rd of March, 1892. But her death record gave her date of birth as 2 March, 1892. Do we believe her because she filled out the form or the informant on the death record? So people, we have to watch for these quirks, but here is a way to iron some of these out. These women gave their own information. Uh, in New Salisbury, Elizabeth Lone listed her age as 21 plus. We had a jokester. Her death record had shown her born actually in 1863 in Louisville, Kentucky. So at the time she registered to vote, she was actually 59 years old. I got a chuckle out of that one, 21 plus. Okay, let's see what was going on in 1920 in this part of the state. I looked up on Wikipedia for the incorporated towns for 1920 and 2010. And going even back further, Corydon in 1850, now that was a pretty long time ago, had 462 people. Harrison County as of 2019 had 40,350. So Corydon's grown quite a bit, but we're a county seat. Most of you have often heard of New Amsterdam. As you know, that's right on the Ohio River. And the Ohio River was very, very different in the olden days, not nearly as big. Would you believe New Amsterdam was the largest town in Harrison County? In 1927, there were 137 people there. Uh, in 1922, there were 166 registered women voters, but a lot of people came from surrounding areas because it didn't matter where you signed up, just as long as you signed. In 2010, the population of New Amsterdam was 27 people. I spoke with a resident recently. He said they're down to 14 people in New Amsterdam. Uh, in 1922, from DePauw, Ramsey, and Milltown, there were 84 women who registered to vote. The town of Elizabeth in 1920 had 193 people. 2010, you were down to 162. And towns like New Amsterdam and Mockport were river towns. And early days, that's where boaters and barges and skiffs all stopped, anchored overnight, bought goods, stayed in the hotels, visited the houses of ill repute, got on their boats and continued on down the river. <laughs> and unfortunately, we just don't have that river trade there today because the river is so different now. There was a town called Northampton I had seen the plotted out version of it. Perfect little town squares and blocks. It's now under the Ohio River and has been for a long time. Ceased to exist. <clears throat> okay, so what was life like in the 1920s? The Eiffel Tower was the world's tallest building. In 1910, 19% 19 of the children from the age 15 to 18 actually went to a high school and only 9% graduated. The Great War ended in 1918. And one of my favorites is the old Chinese saying or curse, may you live in interesting times. And isn't that true today? We're living in interesting times. Uh, when the war ended, some women had already been in war support jobs 
then had to go back to being housewives. And shortly before that, as we all know, was the Spanish flu. I read somewhere that that flu had claimed 600,000 American lives. Uh, at that time, the KKK was coming back up in resurgence. There were laborers striking. There were protests against child labor. But see, the states that had a lot of the fabric and textile industries were afraid of this because they were going to lose some cheap labor. So the world was in a lot of turmoil at this time. Um, at this time, the early 1920s, bobbed hair became a fashion. And I read it was due to an actress who was about to have some surgery. And they told her, you have to cut off your hair. So she left it cut off. And that's why in the 1920s, you saw all these women, the flappers, with the bobbed short hair. In 1920, bread cost 10 cents and had to be packaged in a wrapper. You just couldn't go in and just pick up the loaf and take it home. Butter was 68 cents, eggs were 63 cents. The average family made about $1,500 a year. 1920, one half of the cars on the road were Fords and they were called flivers. And many still had cranks to start them. In 1919, the Fords, boy, progressive, they actually had starters. Gasoline was bought in cans from a pharmacy. A newspaper <clears throat> ad in 1922 for a new car stated it was easy and comfortable for a woman to drive. So off we went. Prohibition began in 1919, lasted until 1933. And the temperance movement was very strong along with women's rights. As you know, they were often going into saloons and stills and whacking up the barrels. Cosmetics, things that were hopefully starting to wear again, ladies. They had arsenic and mercury in them. And heroin was a popular cold medication. And you just walked into the nearest drugstore, got all three of them over the counter. Toasters. Have you thought of the history of your toaster? Probably not. They first appeared in 1910. Zippers in 1917 were called separable fasteners. But by 1920, they became a zipper. I'm not sure how where they got the word zip, probably because it made that noise. The first hair dryers in the early 1920s were about the size of a vacuum cleaner today <laughs> and were very rare. Uh, the genealogical find of these registrations are that we have the women giving their own birthdays and a number of early birth records, as we all know, because of we were required 1882, they weren't registered. We've all seen birth returns where the doctor went in and visited her. Was this your first child, second child, third child? Okay. He didn't complete the forms completely. He waited till he got home and tried to remember. So that's why many early birth returns are incorrect. They usually got the sex of the baby right. And many early newspapers in the 1900s just had births where the fathers went into the local newspaper and said, I got a brand new baby boy last week. So at least early newspapers would give you some record. You'd had a window of a week when this child was born. And these particular records that I did copy, I have like 170 pages of them, all completely indexed. Now, not every woman went to register to vote. Some women didn't think it was important. Uh, and it didn't cover all of the townships. 
The one in this book that had these actual forms were Franklin, Harrison, Heath, Jackson, Posey, Scott, Spencer, Taylor, Washington, and Webster townships. For some reason, the other townships are registered in you know those big old heavy dark brown books and it just gave their ages. It didn't give their dates of birth. And I was very disappointed that I don't know why only these 13 townships used this form. It may have been an experiment. It, they ran out of paper, who knows? That's what makes these so important. I remember reading in the newest book I'm starting on, and those of you who know me know I'm always working on new projects. I'm going through, 10 years ago, I did a book called Exciting Times in Old Harrison County. I started on the 1900 through 1905 court in Democrat and court in Republican and read the newspapers, putting down all the quirky, exciting and weird things that went on in the county snakes in the house, people breaking out of jail, people robbing stores, people running off with other people's wives, you know, you know, the good stuff. Well, now I'm working on 1906 to 1910. And I'm seeing a big change in women just in that time span. More young women were going off to college, out of state, Women were getting professional jobs. They were going down to work and live in Louisville. Came across one entry where we all remember hearing some of us learn Greg shorthand. They would put their big ads in the paper and a young man won the state contest for being the fastest at the Greg shorthand. So we women got in line and we were gonna learn it too. I don't remember any of it. And it, for me, it was difficult to learn. Now we type. Um, so that book is almost totally done. I will be binding it this weekend. And as I said, it has an all name index and it will be selling at the Cardin Genealogy Library for about $20 a copy. I do on my own spiral binding as most of you know. And I noticed around 1908, the divorce rate was skyrocketing. The state statistics of that year said there was one divorce in every eight marriages in the state of Indiana. And I went, wow. Yeah. And we all said, who would believe that never happened? Yes, it did. And fortunately in Harrison County, we have all original records, we've never had a courthouse disaster. And the recorder and the county clerk are very gracious. They say, go at it, Lynn. They know I'm not gonna take anything home and keep it because I don't want it. But the packets of all the original divorces are there. And you can tell the poor county clerk was writing as fast as the man or the woman said, well, he, on the 15th of November, he left me without any means of support and I want alimony and he called me these horrible names or he threw me out in the snow. Great stories. So I'm starting on another book of divorces to cover that time period. And that's fun. That's fun for me. And being that I was born and raised and educated in Wisconsin, I don't have a dog in any of these fights. <laughs> And it's stuff that I could not make up in a hundred years. The newspapers of the early 1900s, that was the YouTube and the Facebook. Little Sally Johnson has the measles. William Jones's family has five people with typhoid. People were falling on farm implements, getting hands and feet and legs mashed in machinery. Buggy accidents were so numerous, I didn't even put many of them in. 
I've owned three horses and never had a horse run away with me, but this was a daily occurrence. Buggies tipped over. Buggies were turned loose on Saturdays from the town square while the owners were shopping and the buggies went home without them. Horses were tied, you know, our lovely square. There had been a wrought iron fence with those lovely little pointed finials at the top. Horses got frightened, reared up, and came down and were impaled on these fences. And all this made the papers. Uh, one doctor left his two-year-old son in his buggy while he ran into his office for a few moments. Off went the buggy, the horse, and the baby. People would run out in the streets and grab them and saved the children. But people were dying mostly of disease, accidents. And I think in the early 1900s, the entire state of Indiana had 58 murders for the entire state. Things have changed a little bit, but reading these old newspapers, if you get a chance, look at them and you feel like you're peeking in the windows of a different world in the early 1900s. In about 1913, I was doing a project for someone, came across where a young man had been bitten walking along a roadway by a copperhead snake. The newspaper article said, the application of five live chickens seemed to take effect. I have no, I, I even asked Fred Griffin, have you ever heard of applying a chicken to a snake bite? And he said, no. Was it a naked chicken? Uh, I, did you pluck the feathers off? Did you gut it? Did you let it peck? I have no idea. There was no explanation, but obviously the child lived. So we who do genealogy love hearing these things and learning about these things. Uh, the newspapers were both so different from each other. The Corridon Democrat was the more popular newspaper because at the time there were more Democrats in the county, but the Corridon Republican put in local news, state news, and they liked the juicier stories too. So in Terre Haute, woman takes poison, woman shoots lovers, but we had a lot of those too. I put those in this book along with some of the trivia and it's been great fun, and I'm looking forward to that book should be ready for production, hopefully by the first part of summer. And I'll let the various libraries and uh, DAR chapters and other ones know when you can find it. So I had one more thing I just wanted to mention about women's suffrage. Susan B. Anthony said, she could mark the progress of the women's movement by the projectiles thrown at her. When the eggs and tomatoes were no longer, or, or were, were no longer of the rotten variety, that was progress. So thank you everyone. It's been great fun for me. I enjoy doing this. And our next speaker is gonna be our Jeannie. Good job. Give us just five minutes. Uh, we'll get Jeannie set up. Love you that much. And ladies, here's my sash. Votes for women. <laughs> Thank you.
Okay. Um, you're talking, it ought to, it ought to spotlight you. Hi, I'm, this is Jean Berg from the Clark County Museum at 725 Michigan Avenue. I may have an echo in here. Hang on just a minute. I'm supposed to say something else. See if I echo. I'm echoing it. <clears throat> I may still be echoing. Anyway, um, returning to the other thing. You want me to put this one back? That I was telling her. I went through all the information that was probably mm -hmm. Mr. Beatles. Mm -hmm. Not a picture of the flood, 37 flood. My mother has pictures of it. Yeah, there's a postcard picture of it that you see online all the time. And oh, it's the main yeah. entrance with the water up the, about halfway up the okay. entrance. She's got pictures of tents that were. Yes, and there's a picture of tents. Right? My grandfather set those tents up. He was the chief really? civilian at the quartermaster depot. <laughs> and he was so mad because as soon as they got the tents set up, the water came up and he had to take them all down in the water. <laughs> okay. All things. Okay. All right. Nice talking. Uh, you too. Ladies, I think we're ready. Um, and when you're ready to, to uh, show you, share your screen, let me know and I'll help you with that. I'm ready. Okay. Well, um, share my screen. Okay. And we're going <laughs> to select. Uh, okay. I see somebody who says. So That's it. Open one, open one of those. One. One, man. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I can just do this from here. Okay. And then. Oh, how do I get it? Memorize that. Yeah. There you can go back here. Mm hmm. And share. And share. I'm looking for that particular thing. Let me open it again. All right. Share screen. Okay. There it is. All right. There it is. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us today for a tour of the treasures of the Clark County Museum at 725 Michigan Avenue. You may have heard that I am the oldest thing at the museum. That's a lie, a falsehood. It's actually this piece of mammoth vertebra that looks like a piece of a fossilized asparagus or a tree or something like that. But we inherited this and it was dug up in 14 Mile Creek. Uh, I'd say about 60 years ago to 70 years ago, and it was in a man's yard and his neighbors came over and they chipped pieces off of it and it made it made him mad. So he put it in his garage and that's where it was until the museum caught it 60 years later. So this is actually the oldest thing at the Clark County Museum. Moving on, hopefully. Do I have to open each one? Yeah, do it that way. Open them each. Oh, okay. This is our puppet canoe. Uh, puppets are have been around since the beginning of time when little girls had dolls. Hang on just a second. It's not showing. Ah, we're not so, showing. Uh, share. I'm afraid we're going to have to share each one. Oh, Diane, sorry. It's okay. Uh, there they are. All right. Now, there's the puppets. These are all made up paper mache, and they are actually uh, about exploration and settlement in Clark County, which, as you may know, uh, began in the 1780s when George Rogers Clark came here and built Fort Clark at Clarksville. 
And these represent Native Americans, the English, the French, and I don't know, the little guy in the back looks like he might be Shakespeare, but I don't think he was ever in Indiana. So they're paddling their own canoe and this thing actually is moved by a puppeteer, all the paddles move. So the next thing that we come upon, we'll get it in just a minute. And this is because I did this wrong. This is just a view of the gallery when you come in the door. We're zooming it. There we go. Share screen. No, that's not it. That's something else. That's it. Okay, they stay on the screen after we share them. This is the view of the gallery looking westward towards the back of the museum. And you can see some little items that we have in there. Uh, this part up here on the right is all war. We were big in war, World War I, World War II, Spanish-American War, the Civil War especially. So that's the section that shows you that. And then we'll go on down a little bit. There might be a better way to do this. I just don't know. We don't it. know what it is yet. So we're doing it this way. <laughs> this is one of the treasures of the museum. It is an 1805 hand-drawn map of Clark County. There it is. It was drawn with iron gall ink on uh, vellum, which is made from sheepskin. And uh, it was discovered in the library when it was over in the quartermaster when they were remodeling uh, the library down here on Court Avenue. And it was drawn by Judge John Miller, one of the founders of Utica. And what one of the things that makes it so valuable is has the name of the property owners at that time in Clark County. So it goes back to 1805. And a lot of the property was owned by George Rogers Clark's brother-in-law, William Cron, who built Locust Grove in Louisville. So this is really a treasure and the library very kindly paid to have it restored and then donated it to the Clark County Museum. So moving on. <laughs> we'll be moving on in just a minute. Thank you for your patience. Very sorry. No, it's my fault. Uh, this is an 1811 picture of Mrs. Catherine Hoke. Uh, she and her husband were founders of J-Town, Kentucky. And this portrait was drawn by John James Audubon. Audubon, uh, you know him more for drawings of birds and animals. Uh, he was fascinated with nature and wildlife, but like General Clark, he wasn't a businessman. He was partners in a store in Louisville uh, with another man because Audubon had a wife and kids that he had to take care of, but he was never at the store. As you can imagine, he was always out in the woods. Well, soon enough, the store went belly up and he had a family to support and nobody was yet buying his pictures of birds and animals. So he resolved to draw a chalk and crayon portraits of people. And this is one of a pair. We, have, we also have Mr. Hoke, but he's not as pretty as Mrs. Hoke. So we're not showing him. But uh, you'll notice the fine artwork in her cap, that it was a sheer cap and, it, and with the way he draws it, you can tell that it was perfectly sheer, which is amazing to me. Uh, and Audubon drawing these things uh, sometimes was commissioned to paint a portrait uh, from these drawings, which he did for Mr. and Mrs. Hoke, and they are in the museum at J-Town, Kentucky. Uh, we have these two at our museum in Clark County, and on the back, there is a pocket on the back of this portrait, and in it are uh, sketches that he made of Mrs. Hoke's nose, because she didn't have a dainty little nose. She had a big German nose. And so he practiced it over and over and over. And we even have those practice sketches. So uh, 1805 again, and treasures at the museum. Moving on to the next one. There he is up here. Yeah. 
This is our railroad station. We built an entire main street inside the museum for any little town in Clark County. And of course you had the barn and you had all those things uh, that uh, every town had. And we had a railroad station. Actually, we had several of them because we have well, quite a railroad history here in Clark County. This is a, our 1940s B&O Railroad conductor's uniform. It's in pretty good shape and we have it displayed on a, a mannequin. He is a, looks like a mixed race mannequin. So that's good. He fits right in with our feelings today about that. And you can see to the left, to his left, there's a scale that you use to weigh the luggage. And this will be an interactive exhibit. It will have a, a working uh, telegraph uh, line and uh, we'll have, uh, uh, you'll be able to see a picture of the train pull into the station in the windows to the mannequin's right, eventually. So we're pretty proud of this little railroad station. It took a lot of work to get this done. I'm going to the next one. This is the inside of our general store. You'll see it in just a second. There it is. Now this will be interactive in that the telephone that you see to the left will ring. Uh, and then if you answer it, you'll be able to hear a woman reciting her grocery list to the grocer that answers the phone. We also have the ability to check people out, not actually physically, but I'm talking about their groceries. Uh, we will be uh, trying to fulfill the uh, requirements for fourth grade social studies so that we can get some schools to start coming through the museum and learning about Clark County history. So the kids will have a basket. They'll be able to pick up some uh, fruits and vegetables out of little baskets on the floor, and we will weigh them on the scale, and then we'll tell them how much it is per pound and let them figure out the math. And then we'll say, okay, then you owe us $2. Hopefully they'll give us money, but probably they won't. So at least they will have learned how to calculate that. Moving on to the next one. You know, Clark County had quite a history in the marriage parlor industry because we had no, we required no bond and you didn't have a waiting period here. So people came here for in the thousands from Kentucky and other places to get married. And this is our organ in our marriage parlor exhibit. It's a real organ and the people who donated it live in Clark County. So it's a Clark County organ. And when you enter the door of the marriage parlor, the organ will play. People will be able to actually get married in our marriage parlor as long as they bring the minister. We don't discriminate. Anybody can get married here. And so uh, we have that set up. And the, the marriage industry in Clark County lasted from 1877, about 100 years. And people came here from all over the place to get married. We do have the picture of a 95-year-old lady who was married during World War II in Jeffersonville. And she's still living, but her husband has passed away. And she kindly donated a young picture of herself for the marriage parlor. So you can come in and learn about that industry in Clark County. It was quite the thing for many years. Going on to the next one. No, this is an exterior. This is an exterior picture of the railroad station that you'll see in just a second. Thank you. And this is a mailbag, a railroad mailbag hanging on the outside there by the window. Uh, Dr. House of Sellersburg invented a mailbag catcher and he had actually had it patented. So there's a Clark County person that had a patent and we hope someday to get one of those, but we hung the mailbag there so we can tell the story. And of course, that's how you go into the station. The brackets that you see underneath the uh, overhang are actual real brackets from uh, Jeffersonville. And uh, some of them, they're very old. Some of them we had to have duplicated and uh, we were able to do that. So that's what that looks like. And moving on to the next one. Oh, you know, we had quite a gambling history in Clark mm -hmm. County. Okay. All right. And we'll see if shared screen works. And we're hanging in there. There it is. 
And we had very kind donations from Dr. Paul Bender, who passed away last month. Oh, no. Yes. And uh, he was, as you know, he wrote the book on gambling in Clark County. And uh, oh, he wow. very kindly shared some of his gambling things with Can us. Yes, that's it right there. That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is a Kino goose. It contained dice. And you turned the goose up and down and uh, it it uh, handled the dice for you. And then they poured out the bottom and you had picked numbers in advance. And if those numbers came up, you won. The little thing that looks like a wrench up on the wall is actually a, a, a tool that calculates or calibrates dice. When you met, wanted to make cheating dice, you drilled out the holes and you poured lead in there. And so that was, an, that was a thing that you could do in your car as you sat outside of a casino and readied yourself to go in and have great winnings. We are, uh, Dr. Bender was not responsible for the picture to the right that shows Theta Barra and her curious brassiere. I have no idea about that and I'm not guilty, so you can't blame me. We're going on sure, to the next story. slide. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Okay, yeah, we're getting to it, we're getting to it. Inside the casino, Number 11, you had the connection with the gangsters. We had local uh, sort of part-time gangsters, I guess, who were involved in the casinos, but the real gang that, that ran things was the Al Capone gang out of Chicago. They controlled all the beer shipments to Clark County. And one guy uh, said that he worked at a gas station down by uh, the car works where you get off the second street bridge. And there was a filling station there. And he said these trucks would pull into the filling station riding very low on their tires. And then later when they came out, they rode high on the tires. So he figured out that they were bringing beer from Chicago. So he decided that gambling was the business to be in. And he became a gang uh, gambler when he uh, later on in his career, but you could see Capone in the center and these two guys up in the left-hand corner were the beer barons. And down on the bottom row is uh, the man who was the gunman at the St. Valentine's Day massacre. So that's the kind of thing we had going on in Clark County, as far as the gangsters were concerned. Uh, they sent men down here to uh, collect the money that was made at the casinos. You can go on a little bit forward. Well, yeah. Number 12 is ladies purse from the 1930s. You'll see it in a minute. It's all metal. You can see it has a copper band around the middle. And this was the kind of thing that they carried to casinos and nightclubs, not something you really wore to church. So we figured that this is a gambling purse. And that's part of our exhibit in the casino. And we're going to the next one. Well, you could keep your hip flask in there as well as your powder muff. This is our casino bar. You'll see it in just a little bit. Every casino had a bar in it. And because our museum is diminutive in size, we had to have a, com a more compact bar. But this gives you an idea of the things that went on inside the casino. And on the bar, we have antique glasses from the, from the time period that the casino was in operation. So uh, that's a fun thing to have. We actually have a spittoon down there on the right-hand side that was donated by Dr. Bender. He, looked, he loved the museum. It was his pride and joy. And he donated a, a very much to us and we will miss him. Going on to the next one. 14. This is down the street and it shows you the exterior of the uh, general store. These things were all hand painted. We have our little fire plug there that came from the Indiana Army Ammunition Plant and the little pug dog next to it pees on the fire plug. There's a little boy looking in the window at the candy display and he's circa 1930s on his scooter from the 1930s. So moving on to the very next one, it'll be the marriage parlor exterior. Mm -hmm. 
we all worked on this, this uh, painting, this facade of the marriage parlor, and it's made to look like a little house. The door is original. And you've seen the inside of it. You saw, you saw the organ. So we're going on to the next slide. The exterior of Doc's Place Casino. This was uh, modeled after the original Ants Cafe on Court Avenue in Jeffersonville. And you'll see that right now. We've got a man in a 1930s suit outside and hat. And he has this COVID mask on, should you be concerned about coming in the museum. Uh, upstairs is a flapper girl in the window with her long handled cigarette stem, oh, peering out into the uh, vacant space below. We named the casino Doc's Place after Dr. Paul Bender. And when he was so proud of that and uh, even remembered us when he passed away. And it'll also be an interactive uh, part of the museum, an interactive display. So we're going to the next one. Inside the casino, this is the guts of a 1930s slot machine. And you'll see that. You see those curious disembodied legs in front of it. That's my reflection. Nothing to worry about, it's not haunted. And we thought that kids and other people would enjoy seeing how uh, the inside of a, of a slot machine actually worked. So we have it uh, displayed that way. And that's another gift from Dr. Paul Bender. Oh, going to the next one. One of the neatest things we have this is in our uh, La Rose Theater exhibit. We don't have a film yet, so we don't have it set up as a theater per se. We have it set up as a parlor. And it's from the late 19th century, early 20th century. And inside this parlor, uh, someone donated to us a diorama that moves. You can't see it move, but as I took this picture, it was moving. This was built in the late 1920s, early 1930s by one of the Hale brothers who lived at the Falls of the Ohio uh, in Clarksville initially and then moved to Louisville. He married and they had one little girl. She was to be the only child. And so he, one Christmas, made this diorama for her. He made all the little furniture. He dressed all the dolls. He did all the little portraits and paintings on the walls and he electrified it. So the lady at the piano plays the piano, the lady to her right plays the violin, the lady with the baby in the rocking chair rocks the baby, and the lady on the, cat, on the red sofa is sewing a sampler and they all do move. And this is quite an accomplishment. It still works. We love it. And kids are fascinated by this. So we have something for people of every age. You're going to the next slide. We're almost finished. Hang in there. And there it is. Okay, and you'll see it in just a minute. This little table was made in 1886 at the Indiana State Prison in Clarksville as a parting gift for the warden at that time. It's all inlaid, it's different woods. Even the stand and base of the museum is inlaid wood. It was made for Warden Craig who lived over on Market Street in Jeffersonville. And he died not too long afterwards, but it was actually made by prisoners. This was part of the great prison reform that was brought on in the 1890s by Quakers and other people concerned about how bad prison life was. And believe me, it was terrible. Uh, not good food. Uh, they summertime they would serve tomatoes in tomato juice, and the prisoners would dip into that, and there'd be flies in it. The black prisoners were always the last ones to come in to lunch. They were discriminated against. The women prisoners were treated horribly, and we don't need to go any further there. Your imagination will fill all that in, and so. The Quakers saw this happening. The state of Indiana found out about it. They fired the warden and they reformed, they put prison reform in. Prior to that time, prisoners were never taught how to do one complete job in manufacturing or anything like that. 
if you were a person who was assigned to lift pieces of iron all day and bring them into the foundry, that's all you ever learned. You didn't learn the complete job. When prison reform came in, they trained men to make clothing, to make furniture, uh, to cut hair, to become barbers that knew how to shave people and, and do all those things that are necessary. So they made pottery, they made ironwork, they did all kinds of things like that. And uh, it was for mostly for free. They got paid very little for their labor, but then the company that was contracted with the prison uh, got most of the profits from that. But this is an example of the kind of work they learned to do. Go on to the next one. Ah, okay. This is just a clipping. It's not anything you need to see. So we may have had some of those slides separate and you need to go below Indie Journal, Appalachian. No, nope, that's it. So, okay, those are the pictures that we have of the museum. We are currently not open in case you're wondering and you'd like to come in. We'd love to have you, but we have no parking lot. The streets torn up in front of the museum. And we figure, we have our fingers crossed to open the very last of March or the first week in April when the city gets the street repaired and you can park again. So please do come and see us. We'd love to have you. There's no admission price. We only ask for donations and it's at 725 Michigan Avenue in Jeffersonville. Thank you so much for attending. Oh, no, 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 don't be sorry. That was wonderful. Thank you all for coming. Um, I guess uh, uh, we'll have to get on another computer to end the meeting, but uh, let me check to see if there are any questions. All right. Well, there are no questions, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, leave. And I guess uh, uh, Harriet, you'll need to end the meeting because you're the you're the the chief engineer's host. Okay, so you can't leave and no order. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs> okay. All right. So that's great. I wanted to get a super time. No, I it mean, I, I loaded those, those uh, on the, the uh, chip okay. and the pump drive, and then they just wouldn't. The, okay, the, didn't automatically do it. Yeah, you, you, yeah, to do it automatically, we'd have to make a slideshow on it. Okay, you have to do PowerPoint. Yeah, PowerPoint or Google Slideshow. Works Google too. Slideshow, is that any easier than PowerPoint? Well, it's free. You don't have to. Wow. You don't have to have any software. Okay. Uh, Okay, I'll try that next time. So, oops, we're still recording.